let's go ahead and, and start by looking at the graph of the secant of theta. And the way I'm going to think of the secant of theta today is that this is simply 1 over the cosine of theta. Recall those reciprocal trig functions. Okay, sine and, and, or, and cosine have these reciprocal trig functions, cosecant and, and secant, that, that come about because of the different ways in which we can make the ratios in the sides of a right triangle. That's really where these different ratios have come from. We can't forget our, can't forget our past here. We're going to start by graphing out the cosine graph. And we're going to use that cosine graph then to help us generate the secant graph. So this graph is the cosine graph. And we're going to use the cosine graph this morning to come up with secant. They have a reciprocal relationship. So what does that mean? Well, one of the things that means is whenever cosine is zero, secant will have an asymptote. Right? We're going to see some more asymptotes in this graph. It's going to have an asymptote because if cosine is zero, since secant is defined as one over cosine, we would end up with a value of one over zero, which is undefined. So our graph is going to have asymptotes at pi over two and at three pi over two. Another thing we can say is that our function, when cosine is one, secant will be one. Think about that for a moment. If the value of cosine of an angle is one, then the secant of that angle must also be one, simply because of this reciprocal relationship. That means here, for example, when x equals zero, when theta equals zero, and cosine is one, secant will be one also. And at two pi, when cosine, the value of cosine of two pi is one, therefore the secant of two pi will also be one. What about when we have the cosine of pi? If we want to evaluate the secant of pi, we need to plug cosine of pi in and evaluate one over the cosine of pi. Cosine of pi is minus one. So when cosine is minus one, secant will also be minus one. So here we have another relationship, another connection there. So the graphs will certainly meet at these three points. Let's think about what happens at the other points. Going from x equals zero, heading towards pi over two, notice that our cosine graph gets smaller and smaller and smaller until it, it reaches zero. If the cosine in our expression here, if the cosine in our expression gets smaller and smaller and smaller, that actually means that secant will be increasing. Secant will be getting larger and larger. And so we can see then that this function will go off and, and head towards the asymptote in that way. Likewise, if we look at going from 3 pi over 2 to 2 pi, initially when we're at 3 pi over 2, we're at an asymptote, but as we move closer and closer to 2 pi, cosine is a very small positive number, which means that secant will be a very large positive number, and so we will come down from that asymptote uh, up above and come down to meet the cosine graph at 2 pi. And we can see the same thing will happen uh, between pi over two and three pi over two, only everything will be negative, right? Everything will be negative because the cosine values are negative, therefore the secant values will be negative. So we'll end up with a graph that looks something like this. And this is, in fact, the graph of the secant of theta. This graph in red here is the graph of secant of theta. And a couple of interesting things to note about this graph, if we look at the relationship between various things here, secant of theta has no zeros. Secant of theta has no roots. And secant of theta doesn't have maximums, it kind of has minimums, right? The, the lowest the upper parts go is down to one, and the highest that the, that the part on the negative side goes is up, to, is up to minus one. So we have sort of an interesting relationship there. What about period? What is the period of our secant graph? How long does it take for it to repeat itself? Well, we didn't draw it in, but the graph will do something like this over here, and it will come back up over here. So we can see where this graph actually repeats itself is along this distance here. So secant, like cosine, will have a period of 2 pi. Let's go ahead and move on now and look at the cosecant. Recall that cosecant is simply the reciprocal of the sine function. So this will not take us very long to do because we can use exactly the same reasoning uh, 
that we used in developing the secant graph. But we will sketch it out here just so that you have an opportunity to look at this graph. So again, we'll start by graphing out the sine function. Here's our, here's our sine function here. Every place the sine function has an asymptote, I'm sorry, every place the sine function has a zero, our cosecant graph will have an asymptote. So our asymptotes here will be at the origin at pi at 2 pi, and our function will do something very much like, like this. We can see the behavior right away just by applying the same reasoning that we used in the previous graph. Again, note that this has asymptotes. These asymptotes are at every integer number of pi, and the period is 2 pi, right? This function will repeat itself over here, and so there will be a distance here of 2 pi between, between repetitions. So we have a period of, of 2 pi. The last graph I want to look at this morning is the cotangent graph and we'll just kind of see the behavior of cotangent here. There are several ways we can approach cotangent. We can think of cotangent as the cosine divided by the sine, or we can think about the cotangent as the reciprocal of the tangent function. So we can use either one of those um, techniques to figure out what the graph of cotangent should look like. I'm going to go ahead and treat this as the cosine divided by the sine, but it may be a good exercise for you to understand how to get this same graph by thinking about this as the reciprocal of the tangent function. So I'm going to start by graphing sine and cosine so we can make use of those graphs. Here is the sine graph, and then we have the cosine graph that does something like this. In this particular case, every place that sine, every place that sine has a zero, we will have an asymptote. When we have a sine value of zero, we're dividing by zero, that, that leads to an undefined expression, and so that gives us our asymptotes. So every place sine is zero, that happens to be at the origin, that happens to be at pi, and that happens to be at two pi. So we have some asymptotes here that we will have to work with and understand the behavior of. And every place that cosine is zero, cotangent will have a zero. So cotangent will have a zero at three pi over two and at pi over two, those are the places where cotangent will have a zero. But now notice that we get a slightly different behavior when we take, when we take this ratio. When we have the sine and the cosine values, we have their ratios when sine and cosine are the same, we end up with a value of one. But notice now, right past x equals zero, as we move past x equals zero, the cosine value is large and the sine value is very small. That means we're going to have a very large positive number. So what's going to happen is we're simply going to end up with sort of the reflection of our, of our previous graph. When we go to, to look at cotangent, we'll see that, we'll see that these are decreasing. Right? They start, they start at infinity and drop down. Again, some things to note about the, the cotangent function and its properties. Cotangent has asymptotes at every n pi. And it has zeros at every 2n plus 1 times pi over 2, where again, 2n plus 1 simply means any odd multiple of pi over 2. And again, just as with tangent, we have a different period. The period of this function is pi. The period of this function is pi. 